<laughs> All right, so here I am talking about intro to quantum computing. And uh, maybe a lot of you guys uh, have much more uh, knowledge and familiar to quantum computing than I do. So uh, if um, I present something incorrect, I really appreciate the feedback. And uh, this is actually uh, more precisely, this is how it works or things like that. But I'll try to do my best job. But um, OK, so intro to quantum computing. And so once again, welcome, everybody. My name is Masaki. Just a little bit of background on myself. I got a PhD in mathematics in the United States. And um, yeah, I taught for two years and my passion is teaching, actually. I loved teaching and uh, I wanted to be a teacher for a long time. And so I taught mathematics for two years in college. A lot of, lot of things happened and I left academia, but um, I am happy to join this community, quantum computing. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, this is um, very much my passion right here, public speaking. So I'm a little nervous, it's been a while, but um. Um, yeah, let's continue. <clears throat> so how, how is quantum computing started? So to talk about that, I think it's, um, it makes more sense. Uh, it makes sense to, uh, look back and, uh, look at the evolution of computers. So back in 1830s, well, this is not precisely 1830s, but up till 1950s, uh, we had this mechanical devices and, um, yeah, we used, how we used to compute or the concept of computing came up and we used to use um, transistors. Uh, well, I jumped to 1950s, but back then we used to use vacuum tubes and we were trying to compute things efficiently with using the bit zero and one. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so vacuum tube, tubes is what we used to use. And then People thought about, well, there's a better way and a more scalable method to compute with uh, uh, transistors. So nowadays we, we have um, smartphone devices, uh, tablets, all those are all transistor based. And um, yeah, it's, it's been truly successful, but we're facing the end of transistors because um, uh, the, the smaller the transistor get, uh, gets, then um, basically it gets more efficient. But um, technically, yeah, so all, all we have to do is make transistors smaller and smaller, but we're just hitting the wall. Well, we can't make it any smaller, basically. So we have to uh, come up with some uh, new way of computing things. And that's basically the quantum computer. And this slide is a little misleading because it's a uh, evolution of transistors is the quantum computer, quantum states, thinking about how to how to newly compute in this way, but it's not quite that way. It's, it's a split. Uh, it's a complete different way of computing things. And we're going to go over that a little bit, but quantum computers will solve today's impossible problems. We're going to touch a little bit about that too, but um, yeah, certain problems intractable on classical computers will be unlocked. And what we're referring here by classical computers is the transistor-based computers, such as our smartphones and laptops. <clears throat> okay, so what is the difference between classical computer and quantum computer? Well, actually they're fundamentally different, very different. Uh, so information unit is classical computers are bit and quantum computers use uh, what's called a quantum bit or qubit is what people call it. Uh, info storage is done by uh, transistors and quantum computers. And I'm only mentioning superconductors and ions, trapped ions, um, but there are much uh, more to it. And many other technologies can uh, support this. Um, so only putting two, two up here, but uh, yeah, th it's just not decided really, not like transistor was the um, best thing or um, it was the scalable and best option back then. But uh, right now we're, we're still seeking what's the possibility here. And info processing is done by logical gates. And here we have quantum gates and information unit equivalent. You can think of a bit by two sided coin. It's either heads or tails or zero or one. Uh, on the other hand, quantum computer uses what's called superposition. And uh, yeah, so that's essentially you can go either with a, a coin, you can only have heads and tails, but with a qubit, you can have zero and one and 
combination of those two. Uh, 50% zero, 50% one. So that's uh, basically the idea here. Uh, and we call that superposition. And units working together, uh, basically for classical computers, no coordination. But in quantum computer, there's something called entanglement. And this makes quantum computer very special. I can't go too much detail into that because I have limited time. But um, yeah, those are the uh, fundamental differences between classical computers and quantum computers. Okay, um, so this is this slide uh, really sums up how powerful quantum computing can be. Classical computers, factoring is actually a very, very difficult, difficult method, uh, of what difficult task for classical computers to perform. Um, well, it might be easy if the number is small, but once the number becomes uh, quite big, it, it gets exponentially difficult. So a 2048-bit number, a best classical algorithm takes 10 to the 34th steps. And that's a lot of zeros, if you think about it. Uh, on the classical uh, terahertz computer um, with a trillion operations per second, which is quite fast, that still can take up to 317 trillion years. That's how long it takes to factor a, a uh, 2048 bit number. On the other hand, quantum computer, we have what's called Shor's algorithm. 10 to the ninth steps can uh, break down the factorization. And also on the quantum megahertz computer with a million operations per second. So that's much less operations per second uh, compared to um, classical version of it. Which um, that can that can uh, factor number very efficiently, uh, realistically, which is up to eight hours, and that's quite a difference, isn't it? Yeah. Um, now this is assuming that we have fault tolerant device, fault tolerant uh, quantum computer um, that is uh, ha having a. Uh, 4099 logical qubits. So, and we're not even close to that point, but in the future, in theory, we can build something like this. And we expect significant breakthroughs in uh, chemistry, optimization, and machine learning with quantum computers. Uh, those three areas, uh, especially quantum computers, are known to perform uh, better and eventually will have what's called quantum advantage. The quantum computers outperform classical computers. And several industries encounter difficulties with mathematical complexity, ranging from finance to healthcare and aerospace. And those um, quantum computers can solve those problems. And I mentioned a little bit about cybersecurity. Our information is transmitted uh, very securely uh, thanks to what's called RSA, um, crypto system. And that's basically a, um, the, due to the difficulty of factoring two large numbers, uh, two, two large prime numbers. That's why our information is very secure. But once, if, uh, once the factoring becomes easy, well, then our information is no longer secure. And that's the idea and po uh, power of quantum computer and many others that I don't get to mention um, because I don't have much time. But um, yeah, they, there's so many fields. Optimization um, and um, simulation can really help those areas. <clears throat> and quantum algorithms uh, application Applications that's uh, coming up in the near term are those areas. <clears throat> yeah, especially uh, I would like to note this image and audio generation. Uh, just this become this is not any like time to uh, talk about my company per se, but uh, uh, let me use this opportunity that the, uh, our scientists worked on the image generation with uh, quantum machine learning and. Uh, Turns out that the result came out to be better than a uh, comparable uh, classical computer uh, performing the image generation. And that's, you know, we have to make sure that it's not done by the super computer, um, the best classical computer or anything like that. It's just a comparable classical computer's result comparing to our quantum machine learning algorithm image generation. But yeah, still um, quantum computers can uh, ex exceed in certain areas and image generations is one of them. And uh, in the long term, there are 
many others、um, that really matters to our lives. For example, drug discovery, especially these days、um, with the pandemic. So、um, think about the days that the, you know、uh, it may only take a month to invent the vaccine, and which we we had to spend a, like a year、uh, after the COVID pandemic、uh, broke down. So、uh, think, things like that, quantum computers can really. Um, help discover new method, new ways to compute things, and it doesn't really really take many qubits to make an impact.、Uh, actually, so that、uh, we have a fifty five a fifty five qubit quantum computer is actually more powerful than the largest supercomputers that we have. So <clears throat> here, scaling up. Summit is the currently the fastest supercomputer in the U.S. and、uh, one Summit is equivalent to let's say 53 qubit machine of a quantum computer, and for just 55 qubit, of course that's you know、uh, one is equivalent to 53. Yeah, we need more than one Summit to perform、um, equivalent to 55 qubit machine. And when and surprisingly, of 60 qubit, which is not doesn't seem to be that many more, but then we actually need 33 summits、uh, machine to、uh, perform equally to that level. So this is really scaling up very fast exponentially, and will eventually hit the limit. Actually, so right here, um, <clears throat> yeah. 150 up to 200 qubits machine,、uh, quantum computer machine, are estimated to、uh, estimated equal to the power of all the computers on Earth. And、uh, when it comes to about this、uh, 200 and some qubits and tran transistors, states equal to the number of atoms in the visible universe. So basically, this is coming to the limit of、um, yeah classical computers. And quantum computers will never、um, be able to be touched by classical computers' possibility after that. So, <clears throat> okay. So, what gives quantum computers so much power? Then、uh, we understood the difference and everything. But quantum computers use、uh, qubits, as I mentioned. And qubits can be in multiple states at once, and this is again called superposition. And superposition can include that I mentioned a little bit, and also、uh, quantum interference. Those those、um, weirdness of a quantum uh, qubit uh, quantum state makes those things possible. <clears throat> Uh, diving into a little bit detail here,、uh, and what is a bit? And this is something that that we use、um, every day with transistors. A bit is actually not a physical object, but rather a state of a two-level system. And I mentioned that the analogy of a coin flip.、Um, a collection of bits is called a bit string, represented by b1, b2, b3. So it can be heads, tails, heads, heads. Tails, 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 heads, and so on, so on. But、uh, we're just representing with zero and one, just for the simplicity. So it goes zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, and this might mean something.、Um, let's say that、um, co computation-wise, or sending the message,、uh, we convert it to bits, and、uh, this may mean, hey, let's meet up、uh, together at nine o'clock, and. Uh, things like that. So this is、uh, how we communicate, and the bits bits can store information that way. And this is how we perform computation these days. But、um, when it comes to qubit, it allows the superposition. So、um, qubit can be in an indeterminate indeterm state. So it can have half heads, half tails, or half zero, half one.、Uh, so it It really is a weirdness of a quantum、uh, state and、uh, qubit, but、um, this is、uh, really the how we are going to compute with the quantum computer now,、uh, moving to the future. And、uh, just to make sure the difference is clear, when we note the、um, string of qubits, we put this、uh, what's called bracket notation, and、uh, there's a reason to. Why we use a、uh, uh, straight line to the left-hand side and a、uh, little 
closing bracket on the right hand side. But, um, yeah, um, this is how we make sure and this distinction between just a regular bit string and qubit string here. Um, but in physical matter, how do we actually represent the qubit? So that now we use the transistor and uh, voltage to represent the zero and one. So what about qubit? It's hard to picture what uh, what uh, stores the in, uh, quantum state information that way. And uh, um, the notable ones are um, the energy level of uh, atom is one of them. Um, atom is um electron is uh circulating here and uh this whether it's in the ground state or excited state um it has a distinct energy level so by uh looking at this let's say at the ground state we we make that represent zero and excited state to be one and so superposition is basically um indeterminate state half and half maybe 30% zero 70% one uh, another thing is the electron spin, spin up or spin down, let it represent zero and one. And again, this, this can represent the superposition. And there's another thing called dual rail qubit. And this is really not how it works, but, um, you can think of a fiber, uh, going through the, uh, well, pho photon is going through the fiber here and we measure it, uh, whether which fiber photon is sitting in. Um, then thinking about superposition, let's say that the, you set a mirror or prism in the center and um, half of the uh, photons transmitted um, to the other fiber uh, by reflection and the other half just stays within the same fiber. So that's, that's the idea here. And this uh, creates the superposition. <laughs> Yeah, photon photon is a quantum uh, me mechanical state. So uh, this is how we store the quantum uh, state here. Um, hardware platforms that's uh, working to, um, yeah, the companies that's working on hardware platforms. Um, there are many companies that's uh, uh, sponsoring this event, and um, yeah, IonQ, IBM, and Google. Yeah, so many, so many. Uh, notable great companies and many, many startups as well. So um, yeah, this is really uh, upfront, um, just a new technology. A lot of people are yeah, working together and also competing. And so it's, it's truly exciting. And uh, here at Zapata Computing, um, my company is working on the software. So it's not listed here, but um, yeah. So we want to make sure that the, we will have a quantum computer someday in the future. And um, yeah, so this is this is truly exciting. And last three slides are uh, dedicated to um, the three fields that the quantum computers uh, can help. And this is uh, starting off with the optimization. Quantum computers are powerful at their uh, optimizing. So for example, supply chains or traffic control air, sea, and land, or fleet operations and deliveries. And you can think of example, uh, I'm, um, I'm using uh, Amazon's name here, um, but uh, yeah, potentially increases Amazon's revenue by one, per uh, one through 3% by applying the quantum optimization. Then Amazon's revenue in 2018 was um, yeah, roughly up to 242 billion. And you can think of a saving one, one to three percent of that uh, revenue optimization, and that's a huge impact. Um, next is machine learning and data mining classification. Oh, sorry about that. Animation is on. I don't know how to turn it off, so it just moved up. Oh, no, please stay there. But uh, yeah, I just have a little bit to mention here. I'm just gonna keep going back here. But uh, voice and image recognition. I noted a little bit that the the work of um, my company Zapata that uh, yeah scientists uh, worked on uh, image generation using machine uh, machine learning. This slide has the animation as well. How can I stop this? Pose, pose the animation. I can't uh, figure it out. But <clears throat> okay, um, it's nope. <laughs> Anyhow, um, yeah, this. Um, 
Uh, this is a simulation working with the chemist chemistry. And um, it's actually Richard Feynman that said, um, sorry about that. This is a problem right here. I don't know how to stop this pose. Oh, yeah, pause. Great. Yeah. So it, it was back in 1982 that Richard Feynman said, um, yeah, to simulate the quantum me mechanical systems with a computer, we need quantum computer. And so he, here we are. We are actually working on simulation and we're just coming to the point that the, we can actually simulate those things. And global impact, you can think of environment, human health, energy, food security, defense and security, and there are many more to it. So working in this field really will change the world and how we do things. Um, and uh, it's it's truly, truly exciting. And I am very happy to be a part of this. And um, yeah, I would like to uh, get to know you guys more. And uh, yeah, in the future, uh, I hope um, I have an opportunity to work each one with uh, each one of you. So thank you very much. That concludes my presentation. And please let me know if you have any questions.